Hi, and welcome to this episode of Let's Get Steaming. Where are we today? Well, we're in the ghost town of Rhyolite, Nevada. We're on the trail of the Tonopah and Tidewater Railway. And I've got a guide here. This is a book written by Phil Serpico of uh, Palmdale, California, which is uh, my old hometown. And we're going to use this as our guide while we walk around and see a few of the sites of the uh, Rhyolite, Nevada. And we're also going to be following some of the old rail lines and finding uh, a bit of the history of this ghost railway that used to exist but doesn't anymore. So uh, stay tuned and let's have some fun here in the ghost town. <laughs> The Tonopah and Tidewater Railroad was the brainchild of Francis Marion Smith, known also as Borax Smith of 20 Mule Team fame. In 1871, Smith migrated from his hometown of Richmond, Wisconsin to San Francisco to seek out his fortune like so many other young men of the time. The lure of mineral wealth from the California gold rush was strong, and mining seemed a more lucrative trade than farming. His fame would be set in mining borax instead of silver or gold. Let's skip ahead in this story about 30 years to July 19, 1904, when the now rich and famous Borax Smith met with his executives of the Pacific Coast Borax Company and signed the Articles of Incorporation for a new railroad. Silver claims were increasing in southwestern Nevada, and Smith wanted in on the action. Mines needed supplies, and railroads were the answer. With the success of his narrow-gauge railroad that serviced his borax mines in the Death Valley, he wanted to expand and build a standard gauge railroad to connect the mines with the now growing and successful communities in the south, all the way down to San Diego, California and the Pacific Ocean. Smith's original vision was to connect the Tonopah Mining District with the growing town of Las Vegas, Nevada. The boon of other railroads in the area between Nevada, Utah and Southern California was growing, and there were power struggles amongst the rail barons, all vying for superiority. Amongst these was Smith's biggest competitor and Senator of Nevada, William Andrews Clark. Clark had recently joined forces with his former competitor, Edward Henry Harriman, and all of his railroads. Smith had actually begun grading operations from Las Vegas, but was faced with increased costs for delivery materials due to Clark and Harriman's San Pedro, Los Angeles, and Salt Lake Railroad that serviced Las Vegas. Smith stopped construction to the horror of Las Vegas residents who were hoping for the rail line. Smith was then courted by the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe to connect with them in Ludlow, California, and offered reduced rates for moving construction materials to Smith's teams. The ATNSF had a positive past history with Smith and his shipping of borax from his Death Valley mines at the Daggett, California. The route for the TNT was changed to be a direct route north from Ludlow through Death Valley towards Tonopah, bypassing Las Vegas. It would also connect with other mining operations in the area. As initial construction began towards Tonopah, Senator Clark was also trying to serve the mines with his own Tonopah and Las Vegas Railroad that was under construction at the same time. While the TNT pushed north towards Beatty, Nevada, Senator Clark's Las Vegas and Tonopah had already reached the bustling mine town of Rhyolite via a branch line, the Bullfrog and Goldfield Railroad. Borax Smith had been bested by Clark. Rhyolite was centered amongst all the mines in the region, making it a boom town that supported the rich Bullfrog Mining District. The station that stands today was built for the Bullfrog Goldfield Railroad in March 1908. As it was being built, the mining town of Rhyolite was already starting to diminish as some of the mines started to play out. This played to the favor of the TNT as Smith was able to merge his operations into the Bullfrog and Goldfield Railroad, completing his vision to the mines in the area. Not all of the mines had packed it in, as Smith was able to provide supplies and fresh produce further north to Goldfield, Nevada, only 27 miles short of his goal of Tonopah. It's not just the ghost railroads that we're going out and visiting on this trip. Behind me is the Owens Valley, and you can see the Owens Dry Lake. Well, 
It used to be a real lake years ago before the city of Los Angeles came in and bought up all the water rights and drained the valley dry and it was an ecological disaster for agriculture and for the lake and as it dried up, well, the winds would blow alkaline and cyanide infested dirt and well, that wasn't good. So they're supposed to be putting the water back into it. The small town that you see along the banks of the dry lake is Keeler, California, which was the southern terminus of the Southern Pacific narrow gauge, which began as the Carson in Colorado. So we're here to visit the reincarnation of the Carson in Colorado up in Independence, California, as they celebrate the silver spike of their new engine house for SP narrow gauge number 18, a 460 that used to run up in the valley. Keeler behind me was the southern terminus and the northern terminus, when Southern Pacific owned it, was Laws, California, just outside of Bishop. You'll see more about Laws later on because in September, they're gonna take number 18, which is back in steam, up to Laws and pull it in alongside its sister locomotive number nine, which has been sitting there since the road was abandoned in the 1960s. Number nine was brought up to Laws and parked there as a reminder and a memento of the steam that used to run through the valley. Well, I'm not sure how well this is gonna come out because of the wind. It's the afternoon in a desert valley. Wind's blowing because this is what it does in the desert in the afternoon. As the heat leaves, the wind kicks up. But what we're looking at is the standard gauge road bed that went to the transfer trestle and here you can see the foundations for the tr transfer trestle. Gondolas would be moved into position underneath the transfer trestle above it. The narrow gauge Southern Pacific locomotives would be pushing the A-frame gondolas and perlite cars to drop their load of ore down into the standard gauge waiting for transfer to take that ore down for processing. Off in the distance, you can see the abutment of where the trestle would come down and meet the roadbed. Here, here. Larry, very early on in our 
project there, he said, he said, I got a little money, and he said, I'd like to see that locomotive run before I die. Thank you. 